It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Patrons heard this episode first. If you'd like to join our Patreon, visit the link in our show notes, or go to patreon.com slash themurderdiariespod. Welcome back to another episode of The Murder Diaries. I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. The 4th of July is a time for celebration in the U.S. Red, white, and blue adorn pretty much everything from shopping centers, storefronts, patios, porches, clothes, you name it. In 2006, the 4th of July would be the last holiday Roxanne Paltoff celebrated. The last time that her family saw her. She said goodbye to them after some 4th of July celebrations to go be with her boyfriend. The two were going to spend a few days together in a motel in the rougher part of town. It was their second anniversary, and a motel was the best option for the pair to spend an extended amount of time together. They both lived at home with their families, and those families didn't approve of the relationship. After an argument at the motel, Roxanne disappeared, and she's been missing for 16 and a half years. This is her story. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. Roxanne Elizabeth Paltoff and her boyfriend, Louis, were getting ready to celebrate their two-year anniversary that was coming up on the 4th of July in 2006. This is also the same day as the U.S.'s Independence Day. After some 4th of July festivities, the couple planned to spend time on their own. They were going to stay at a local motel, the Budget Inn. Roxanne went home to grab a couple of things before the pair headed off to the motel. She told her mom, Liz, I'll be home in a couple days. Liz responded with, call me. The two spoke multiple times every day. Born on January 3rd, 1988, Roxanne Elizabeth Paltoff was the oldest of five children. She had three younger sisters and a younger brother. Her mom, Liz, recalls for ID Discoveries disappeared that Roxanne had a beautiful smile, a wonderful personality. She had a good heart and would give you the shirt off her back. Here's Liz talking about Roxanne for Fox. She was beautiful. And just not only the outside, it was what's inside her, the love and the care that she cared for people and her selflessness. She would give up for herself just to give to others. And she was truly like that. And that's what made her really special. Roxanne and her family were very close. A friend of hers recalls in an interview that Roxanne used to essentially get homesick if she was away for too long. She always made sure to go home and spend time with her family. According to her sister, Rosalind, Roxanne was the one that everyone looked up to. Growing up in Austin, Texas, Roxanne attended McCallum High School. She left McCallum High School after her junior year, and instead she was working on her GED through the local Goodwill. At the time of her disappearance, she only had about one more test to go before she earned it. If you don't live in the U.S. or Canada, Goodwill Industries is a collection of social organizations that aim to help communities through job training programs, employment placement, and other community enrichment-based programs. Goodwill raises money at their brick-and-mortar stores where donated clothing and household items are sold. As I mentioned, Goodwill has job prep and placement programs. And now a word from today's sponsor. One of the most exciting things about it being a new year is that you have no idea what's in store for you. There could be new travel experiences, new jobs, or even just picking up a new skill. And there's no better way to start 2023 off than by learning a new language. I'm personally doing this right now with Babbel. It's a language learning app that's sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can too. This should come as no surprise, but I'm a pretty big nerd and I love learning new languages. I actually have the highest subscription that Babbel offers and right now I'm working on Italian. Honestly, you guys, I mean it when I say addictively fun. I literally do it in bed. 
With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages. And like Paige was saying, it is fun. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to the lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, you can join us in all the fun that Babbel offers and get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash diaries. That's babbel.com slash diaries for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. While Roxanne was earning her GED, she took advantage of that opportunity and began as an intern at a florist shop. Floral design was an interest of Roxanne's. The florist that she worked with describes that Roxanne was creative and talented. Her mom, Liz, told The Vanish Project, quote, flowers brought her joy and happiness, and she liked seeing that on other people. Everyone in the florist shop got along with Roxanne. She fit into her new role easily and worked hard. She also did some work with the Census Bureau. On top of everything Roxanne was working so hard on, she also had a boyfriend. In 2004, Roxanne met a man named Lewis when she was 16 years old. The pair met at a bus stop around the 4th of July. When she met him, she was under the impression that he was around her age, maybe a little older. However, Lewis wasn't just a little older. He was 12 years older than Roxanne. It's not clear if Roxanne was ever made aware of the truth behind Lewis's real age and hid it from her family or just never knew, but her family wasn't aware until after her disappearance that Lewis was 12 years older. By the time she disappeared, he was 30. Red flags were flying for Liz when she first met Lewis. He didn't have a job, he didn't have a driver's license, but She gave him the benefit of the doubt. At first, she would offer, like, hey, do you want me to help you get your driver's license? Things like that. She wanted to help him advance. But Lewis was resistant. Eventually, Liz had a disapproval of the relationship. She felt like he was holding Roxanne back in life, who was trying to get ahead. According to her family, Roxanne wasn't really approved of by Lewis's mom either. For that reason, the pair spent a lot of time away from their families when they wanted to be together. That's why when the pair wanted to celebrate their second anniversary on July 4th, 2006, they decided to book a room at the local Budget Inn. As I mentioned earlier, after the 4th of July festivities, the pair headed to that motel. On July 7th, 2006, Roxanne was still spending time with Lewis since she had left on the 4th of July. She called her mom and asked if it was okay to stay one more night with him. Liz wasn't entirely okay with the idea. She wanted her to come home. The family had some plans to go shopping in San Marcos, Texas the next day. So Liz told Roxanne, hey, you should come home so that in the morning we're all together, we can get ready and just head out. Roxanne was not on board with that, though. She told her mom she was going to spend just one more night at the motel with Lewis, and she would be home early in the morning to go on the shopping trip with them. Liz, a bit upset with her older daughter, said, okay, fine be that way. Those were her last words that she said to Roxanne, and that guilt still sits with her today. The next morning, Roxanne didn't show for the shopping trip. With no further word from her by noon, July 8, 2006, the family ultimately decided that Roxanne was not going to come home and join them. They figured she was staying with Lewis despite her promise to be home early that morning and go shopping with them. They didn't call or reach out to Roxanne because, again, they figured that they knew where she was with Lewis. With that, they left from the mall and enjoyed themselves by about noon. The family returned from their shopping trip in San Marcos around 4.30 p.m. Roxanne was still not home. But again, the family was still thinking she's spending yet again another day and night with Lewis. But then around 9.30, Liz got a call from Lewis on Roxanne's phone. He asked her if she had seen or heard from Roxanne. Liz, immediately thrown, says, like, what do you mean? She's been with you. That's when Lewis says he hasn't seen Roxanne since around 8 p.m. the previous night. He explains that they had an argument at the motel and Roxanne walked out of the room that they were sharing. His story continues saying that he followed her out and tried to get her to come back, but Roxanne refused. He walks away and goes back to their room. 20 minutes later, he returned to see if he could find Roxanne and try to get her to come back again, but she was nowhere to be found. That's the last time Roxanne was ever seen. Her purse, cell phone, the clothes that she had brought to the motel, they were all still there. Everything. 
All Roxanne had on her was what she'd been wearing that day, a peach or pink colored tank top, light blue shorts, and flip-flops. The concern in Lewis's voice and her mother's instinct had Liz feeling like her daughter was in danger. It didn't make sense to the family. Why, if Roxanne was mad and wanted to leave the motel and not return, didn't she have her stuff on her? It wasn't normal for her to just disappear or not call home. Even her friends knew this about her. Her friend and coworker from the florist told ID Discoveries disappeared, quote, she was responsible about keeping up with her family. Roxanne and Lewis had argued before, but this whole situation was different and it didn't sit right at all. The family set out to the budget inn where Roxanne and Lewis had been staying in North Austin off I-35 at Runberg. This area isn't the safest in Austin. Liz describes it as rough. As soon as they got there, Liz showed anyone she could pictures of Roxanne and was asking them if they had seen her, letting them know she was looking for her. No one claimed to have seen or know Roxanne. Liz kept in contact with Lewis at this time, and they were calling each other back and forth with no luck of finding Roxanne. Finally, it was time to call the police. Lewis and Liz both call 911. Liz also organized search efforts, and the APD's Missing Persons Unit launched its investigation to find Roxanne. The two things that concerned investigators most, according to Detective James Scott, were one, the area from which she went missing. Again, it wasn't the best area. And two, how abnormal it was for Roxanne to be out of touch with her family. Both of these concerns pointed to the possibility that Roxanne was a victim of foul play. The police started their investigation at the motel. Only when they arrived at the Budget Inn, they realized things were going to be more difficult to investigate than they had imagined. A bookkeeping error hindered them from being able to know who was in which motel room at the time of Roxanne's disappearance. Nonetheless, how many people were even there at the time? The faulty bookkeeping indicated that Roxanne stayed in room 217. Police, skeptical that it was even the right room, given that bookkeeping error, decided it was worth to check out that room anyways. Unfortunately, as soon as they opened that motel door, it was clear that no evidence of Roxanne or anybody for that matter remained in that room. It was clean, as you would hope a motel room would be after someone reaches their checkout dates. But besides this, it was five or six days after Roxanne's disappearance at this point. Detective Scott explains that the room had been cleaned at least three times since Roxanne would have stayed in it, if it was even the right room. With that in mind, police focused their efforts in the immediate area around the budget inn. As the saying goes, someone knows something, and investigators wanted to find that someone. They spoke with people in the area, hoping that somebody knew or saw something related to Roxanne. Unfortunately, this area, again, is a high crime area. And as Detective Scott puts it, quote, a lot of possible witnesses are already involved in some type of criminal activity. So these people weren't really willing to work with the police. Roxanne's boyfriend, Lewis, was also proving to be difficult to make contact with. Despite his initial contact with investigators, Lewis stopped returning their calls. He was the last person to see her alive. So investigators needed his help and cooperation. He then showed up at Roxanne's mom's house and returned her belongings five days after she went missing. He gave Liz a bag of clothing, Roxanne's cell phone, and her purse. Inside the purse were her rings, a toothbrush, a driving study book, and her debit card, and some makeup. Notably missing from the purse was Roxanne's ID. As Roxanne's friend and her family went through the bag of clothing, it was clear it was not Roxanne's. Her sister Rosalind describes the clothes as clothes I had never seen in my life. Roxanne is her big sister. She knows her clothes. All the girls shared clothes a lot, as sisters often do. So again, she knew what was Roxanne's and what wasn't. More than the clothes not being familiar, they weren't even Roxanne's size. They appeared to be more like children's sizes. The younger sisters were even like, yeah, this is too small for even me. So it was really concerning. One piece of clothing that really stuck out to Roxanne's friend as they went through them was a denim skirt. It had a sheer fabric ruffled piece attached at the bottom. Roxanne, according to her friends and family, would have never worn something like that. The friend told Vanish Project, quote, she would have ripped that fabric off. Liz brought up the concern about the clothes to Lewis, and he told her that he had just gathered them quickly up off the floor, thinking they were hers. 
The family was also busy returning to the motel area canvassing to find any sign of Roxanne or information from someone who saw her. They searched gullies, abandoned houses, storm drains, dumpsters, you name it, they looked there. They also knocked on doors, asking people in the area if they had seen Roxanne and shared the story about her disappearance. Unfortunately, the efforts didn't yield any leads. So they turned to Roxanne's cell phone records. Over 300 phone calls were on that phone record from July 7th, 2006 onward. It's truly bizarre when you see how many calls were placed on that phone, one right after the other. As Liz says, it was like constant calling. Calls to pizza places and calls to and from the budget inn were all included on this phone log. There were also calls to different women on this phone log. And one of the numbers really stuck out to investigators. It was a New Mexico number, and it belonged to Lewis's ex-girlfriend in Albuquerque. Now, despite this constant calling, there was an hour span of no phone call activity on the evening of July 7th. And the several calls that had been made to Lewis's ex-girlfriend were made after that hour span. When police contacted her to discuss this, she confided in them that Lewis told her he was in some kind of hot water and needed to get away to go out to New Mexico and stay with her for a while. Lewis and this ex-girlfriend had a dark, violent relationship. She'd actually even moved out of state to get away from Lewis. At one point, things got so violent that Lewis broke her wrist and she was forced to seek help at a battered woman's shelter. She was afraid of him given their past, so she did not agree to let him come stay with her. Roxanne's family feared that her relationship with Lewis was also volatile. A year before she went missing, Liz and Rosalind were driving past a bus stop on their way home from a routine appointment for Rosalind to get her braces tightened. That's when they saw Roxanne. They pulled over to let her into the car and say, hey, we're going home too, why don't you come with us? And Roxanne gets in the car. She was wearing sunglasses at first, but as soon as she took them off, they noticed that she had two huge black eyes and an injured nose. Roxanne claimed that she was catcalled and that Lewis got in a fight with a group of guys that had done the catcalling and that she got hurt during this fight because she was trying to break it up. Liz drove Roxanne straight to the ER. Her nose wasn't just broken, it had detached. To fix it, it required reconstructive surgery. Roxanne later admitted to the friend and coworker from the florist that she didn't get hurt because of a fight that Lewis got in with a bunch of guys. He had hit her. The friend told this to investigators that Roxanne was hit by Lewis in the past, and they decided to turn their efforts back towards him. This should be no shock to anybody, but Lewis's violent past, admission to arguing with Roxanne at the time she went missing, and that he was the last person to report seeing her alive, all led investigators to consider him a suspect. They ran a background check on him. That's when they found out that besides the violent past, he had a rap sheet that included involvement in some smaller crimes and a conviction for delivery of a controlled substance. Liz explains that she was furious to find this out. She had no idea that he had spent any time in jail or had this kind of past. This criminal history rap sheet is also how Roxanne's family discovered his real age. He was 30 at the time of her disappearance, 28 when they met. Lewis became increasingly elusive and hard to make contact with not long after Roxanne went missing. He told investigators, I already told you everything I know. On July 19th, he finally agreed to a face-to-face meeting with investigators. He arrived, but that's about the only cooperation he showed at the time. He didn't answer many of the questions. It is his right not to answer, but it also made him look really suspicious to investigators. Lewis did give some information, though, at least regarding his side of events. When they questioned about the phone calls that he had made on Roxanne's phone after her disappearance, he claimed that, yeah, he was mad at her for whatever their argument was about and for taking off. So he called a bunch of girls, including the ex in New Mexico. He also said that he spent the rest of that night with an employee from the Budget Inn and that she could verify his alibi that he was there the rest of the night after Roxanne left. This employee did do just that. She confirmed Lewis's story. She says she saw Roxanne leave with Lewis behind her trying to get her to come back, but then that he turned around and walked back on his own to their room. She then ended up hanging out with Lewis in their room from 10 p.m. to 3 p.m. This accounts for where Lewis was that night. The employee that hung out with Lewis also indicated that, yes, Roxanne's stuff was there in the room while they were there, but 
everything looked normal. The room wasn't a mess and it didn't look like anything horrible had happened there. Before police could look more into what was going on with Lewis and the employee, Roxanne's ID was found under some unanticipated circumstances. On July 13th, 2006, a call was made to Austin police from the Motel 6 down the street from Budget Inn. A woman claimed that she had been assaulted there. The suspect had just left the scene, but surprisingly left his wallet behind. As the scene was being searched, the suspect, a deaf man named Jeffrey, returned. He was then detained and questioned. The victim didn't end up pressing any charges against Jeffrey, but during the course of Jeffrey's detainment, Roxanne's ID was found in his wallet. The patrol officer didn't recognize her as a missing person or look into it right at that minute, but the ID was placed in the station's lost and found. Four days later, the station prepared to mail the IDs back to the rightful owners from the lost and found. This is when they discovered that Roxanne was a missing person. Those handling Roxanne's case in the missing persons unit were contacted. They tracked down Jeffrey, and with the help of an ASL interpreter, Jeffrey claimed that he gave Roxanne and Lewis a ride the day before she disappeared. Lewis confirms this. He says that Jeffrey gave the pair a ride to go buy cigarettes, and thus Roxanne had her ID with her at the time. So it was completely plausible that Roxanne had lost it in Jeffrey's car. What stuck out to investigators, though, is that Lewis and Jeffrey disagree on the driving route. Jeffrey says he took them from downtown Austin to the Budget Inn area at I-35 in Runberg. Lewis says it was just to a Walgreens that wasn't far from the motel and then back. Jeffrey claimed to investigators that he was a good friend of Roxanne's and that he wanted to retain the ID to give it back to her himself. Her family, however, says no way they were not friends. They didn't know him and they knew Roxanne's friend. In paraphrase, Rosalind says she would have expected to have been aware and remember a friend with special needs like Jeffrey. Ultimately, police weren't able to verify Jeffrey or Lewis's story about how or why the ID was in Jeffrey's car. So they turned back to the employee from the budget in. She was finally able to come in for a polygraph test and ended up solidifying Lewis's alibi that he was in the motel room with her from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Police were no further along than before, and they were stuck with more questions about what happened to Roxanne. Detective Scott deemed Roxanne involuntarily missing. She wasn't missing on her own volition, and as of yet, there were no signs that matched Roxanne being a runaway or someone trying to go, quote, long-term missing. After two weeks, her family was left in the eerie silence of Roxanne's absence. They felt helpless and like nobody cared. It felt like Roxanne was just left as a memory forevermore, with no answers as to what happened to her. Liz decorated a set of shelves where she put Roxanne's perfumes, letters, trophies, ID cards, pieces of Roxanne that she can remember her by and turn to when she's missing her. A lot of rumors at this time circulated too. Her siblings faced some terrible things being said about Roxanne at school. The rumors were flying around that Roxanne fell into a world of substance abuse and sex work because of the area that she went missing from. Even if she had, which it's believed by those who knew her best that there was no way, but again, even if she had, it's still not acceptable for someone to cause her to go missing or to do harm for her. Detective Scott agrees the rumors were wrong. Roxanne wasn't in that area because she was into the drugs and sex work that are prevalent there. She was there because she was with Lewis, which made her feel safer being there at the time. In fact, any time that Roxanne had ever even been in that area, she was with Lewis. Then three weeks after Roxanne went missing, a discovery was made that could possibly change everything. The remains of a young girl were found in Southeast Austin on July 27th. The team working Roxanne's case was notified. They asked Liz for Roxanne's dental records so that they could compare them to the remains. And she remembers thinking, this is it. They found Roxanne's body. Quote, oh my God, my daughter's dead. Samples of Roxanne's DNA were also sent to the lab so that they can compare it to the remains. It would take over three weeks for the results to come in. In a moment of both relief and really trauma, the results came back negative. The remains were not Roxanne. Liz says, quote, it was such a low that it happened, but it was such a high that it wasn't Roxanne. In March of 2007, a billboard with Roxanne's photo and info stating, Missing, please help, went up in the area from which she had gone missing, just a block away from the budget inn. 
Over 200 people have reported seeing Roxanne. Every tip that comes in is investigated, but so far none have led to Roxanne. A reporter from the Austin Chronicle, Jordan Smith, that's been following Roxanne's case says it best when she says, all the pieces are there. Nobody's being fully honest about what they know. A year and a half passed with little movement. But then in March 2008, Lewis, who had long been off the radar after his alibi was confirmed by the budget and employee, was back in the sides of investigators as a suspect. His girlfriend at the time had submitted a statement to investigators that claimed Lewis threatened her and further intimidated by insinuating that he'd killed Roxanne. This was the mother of one of Lewis's children, and she, just like Roxanne, was much younger than him. They were meeting to discuss child support and child care-related issues, and he was whispering these intimidating threats to her about behave because you don't want to end up like that girl Roxanne. She had a right to fear for her safety after that incident, and thus it became a criminal matter. She made the statement to police and was granted a restraining order. Lewis was charged with making a terroristic threat and ended up with a 104-day sentence. While he was in custody, he was questioned about why he insinuated that he'd killed Roxanne. He became aggressive and, as Detective Scott recalls, confrontational. He denied saying anything close to a confession of murdering Roxanne. He stated that his girlfriend was just trying to get back at him because he was done with the relationship. Unfortunately, there was still no solid physical evidence against Lewis, so there wasn't much to go off of. In August 2010, remains were found in Albuquerque that were believed to possibly be Roxanne. Remember, more than just a physical match of what they were looking for, Lewis had called his ex-girlfriend in New Mexico after Roxanne went missing. It was too coincidental not to move forward with testing if the remains belonged to her. They sent Roxanne's dental records to the medical examiner in New Mexico. The detective spared Liz the trauma of having to wait, all while hoping that they may be getting some answers, but also might be possibly finding out that her daughter was for sure deceased, and he didn't tell her of the findings or that they were comparing Roxanne's dental records to these remains. He didn't do so, at least, until he knew whether it was or wasn't Roxanne. And in the end, it wasn't Roxanne. In May of 2019, Detective Jamie Harville put in a warrant to T-Mobile for her phone records, stating that, quote, no historical data has been requested prior. It's not entirely clear what they have now versus what they had before for Roxanne's phone records, but they now know that Roxanne's phone made 12 calls that accrued airtime or roaming charges on July 7th between 6.44 p.m. and 8.42 p.m. This is the time period that Roxanne left the hotel, according to Lewis. This is also the time when there was approximately one hour of no phone activity. We weren't able to find any resources that explain where exactly Roxanne's phone was when it was roaming, and there isn't any ping data available to the public or expressed in any interviews. This may be in large part because Roxanne's phone was basically a brick-style Nokia, as Rosalind describes it. It didn't have GPS. These new findings shifted the investigation from its initial theories that whatever happened to Roxanne happened right there near the budget inn to maybe something could have happened further away. Liz and Detective Scott remained friends, and for a while there, they spoke every Wednesday. And definitely during their interviews for Disappeared, they were still in constant contact. Neither of them are going to stop until Roxanne receives justice. Detective Scott reassures listeners of his interview, as long as Roxanne is missing, I have to look for her. This case is still an active missing persons case, and unfortunately, it's believed that she met with foul play. Quoting Liz, there's a light off where she went away. Roxanne Elizabeth Paltoff has been missing since the night of July 7th, 2006 from Austin, Texas, at the area of I-35 and Runberg. She's classified as endangered missing. She is a Caucasian female born January 3rd, 1988. She would be 35 years old today and was 18 when she went missing. At the time of her disappearance, she was 5'4 and 115 pounds. She was wearing a pink or peach colored tank top, light blue shorts, and flip flops. She has light brown hair and green eyes. Her belly button was pierced at the time she went missing. Her ears were double pierced. She has a mole on the right side of her neck and a scar the size of a quarter on her left knee. 
Roxanne has previously fractured her nose, and one of her top front teeth is false. She often went by the nickname Roxy. If you have any information about Roxanne or this case, please contact the Center for Missing Persons at 910-343-1131. You can also call the 24-hour tip line at 910-232-1687. Be sure to follow us on our socials at The Murder Diaries Pod on Insta and TikTok. And until next time, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Is your daily grind getting you down? A Thermospas hot tub may be the solution. Just a few minutes under those powerful, soothing jets, and all your stress seems to melt away, like you're lying on a cloud of bubbles. You'll not only feel better, but sleep better, too. Call 877-861-4672 now. And for a limited time, save $1,250. Call 877-861-4672 or visit thermospas.com to schedule a free on-site assessment. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.